So, so maybe just uh, quickly there, like when you think about implementing in those areas, you know, Jackie mentioned equity long short. Are, are you looking sort of uh, to get into like the credit side of the equation here, or where, where do you kind of, you know, taking it a level deeper, kind of look for that real opportunity? Um, maybe we'll go to Mark, then we'll talk a little about the quant side as well. Sure. Well, I oversee credit, event, and relative value, which is a pretty broad uh, mandate. So uh, we have a team of people doing that. Um, I am partial to credit, uh, just because the credit expertise and investment uh, knowledge is very valuable. You can literally invest up and down the capital structure. Um, from stressed, from performing to stress to distressed, high yield, uh, that level, that sort of analysis and that sort of knowledge is very, very valuable. But in terms of pursuing those opportunities, again, our preference as an allocator to managers is to uh, focus on managers who can do more than one thing. We try not to uh, pigeonhole managers into one area, even though they might have tremendous expertise there. We think there's value to be created from having the flexibility to move across uh, asset classes, as long as it's within your core expertise. So within structured credit, for example, uh, yes, I could buy a commercial you know, CMBS-only manager or an RMBS-only manager. My preference is to invest in somebody who can move across those two markets and pursue the opportunities when, uh, when they're there and then get out when they're not. Uh, somebody who's much closer to those markets than we are, we are obviously a couple of steps removed. Um, so th that's our approach, and in general, it's served us uh, well over the years, so we're sticking to it. Thanks, Art. Uh, maybe, Mark, we'll shift to you just on the quant side, thinking about, you know, where those real opportunities are, where you're focusing your efforts, your team's efforts in terms of research. Sure. Um, I mean, look, for, I think, at least for our world of quant, uh, we find always a lot more opportunities when volatility is higher. Um, and when I look at the current vol environment, I don't think it reflects the reality of the macro picture that we're looking at now. Um, so it's I'm actually, understating it. Yes, it's very much so. Um, I think we started something in 2022, then we took a one year break from it. So the period from, incidentally enough, um, our own risk index went risk seeking in October of last year, and it remains risk seeking until now. But when I look at the granular level data, uh, we're, I'm seeing a lot of conversions now where from these levels, it wouldn't take much to sort of flip it. But one year of risk-seeking behavior is fairly long you know, in one cycle that we've seen. Now, there are certain factors that I think have caused this to happen. I think one of them was the fact that, um, you know, uh, when you look at the US consumer coming out of the whole uh, COVID sort of giveaway period, uh, was about $4.3 trillion richer. So that extra cushion allowed the U.S. consumer to really you know, withstand the first few rounds of asset hike, of uh, price hikes. Uh, well, I think we're down to about $19 billion in that, um, in that excess. You, know. uh, you look at another factor, which is you know, the, the debt ceiling debate in the first six months of this year that caused an impromptu $600, $700 billion QE when we're supposed to be in a QT. Um, so once these sort of extraneous factors go away, I think uh, markets will revert sort of to, to continuing the job that started in, in 2022. And I think one of the most interesting things that I've seen begun in 2022 is really what's happening to long dated rates. Um, I think long dated rates have been in one super cycle from the early 80s when Volcker uh, pretty much vanquished that inflation run, um, I think, you know, and, and I'll preface say this, our strategy is quantitative. So whatever my views are, have nothing to do on what we do. But my own personal feeling is that, is that 2022 marked the end of that 40 year super cycle we've seen of lower interest rates. And we're embarked on sort of the next super cycle of higher interest rates. And, you know, the reasons for that are demographics, uh, the size of our debt, uh, the general leverage factor. So I think that, uh, I mean, look, I think the fact of the matter is, I think we had such a responsible monetary and fiscal policy for 14, 15 years from 2009 to 2022. That built so many imbalances into the system uh, that's going to take us years and years to work from under. And I think we started that in 02. We took a one-year break, but we're ready to sort of continue that. Yeah, you're hearing bubbles popping, right? Like kind of like left, right? Well, I mean, I'll give you one simple example. I always like in a lot of my investor meeting. You know, I try to explain why markets go up and down, and I always talk that, you know, 
at the any advanced state of a business cycle, uh, money starts getting misallocated. When money starts getting misallocated, um, markets correct to reorient that money to where it best utilized. You get to a certain price where it is value. You people come in, you start the next healthy bull trend. But I always found it very difficult to explain what it means to money being misallocated. Well, I mean, um, you know, after watching a few of these NFTs selling at Christie's and Sotheby's for 85, 90 million dollars, I have one example there. Another example in watches where, you know, Patek Philippe last year was asking buyers to write an essay of why they should be allowed to buy a 300,000 Patek Philippe watch. And you know what? That gives me a lot, big confidence that we have a lot of volatility coming. And still a lot of excess capital. And a lot of excess capital. And anything you want to add or anyone want to jump in? Yeah, where we're spending a lot of time at the moment will be uh, lines of research, which are very parallel to what Mal uh, Mark has mentioned, i.e. regime switching. And I know there was a talk this morning addressing regime switching. There's different definitions for that. Uh, I don't quite believe in regime switching in a very technical sense of the word. Why? Because I've got my teeth kicked in for the last 20 years trying to harness the power of all these beautiful econometric models and trying to estimate these things just on the virtue of price and returns alone is politely said fraught with difficulty. Uh, wh where I believe there is certainly a bit more potential is to try to capture the broad strokes of what is driving some of the key categories of the key things in the portfolio. You know, why should carry profitable? What are the environments where trends can make money? In which environments do I think that market imbalance, okay, which benefits from the asymmetric positioning of market participants, is likely to continue to last and therefore I should continue to invest in them? So, and, and because I'm, I don't have a discretionary board in my body, then... The, <laughs> What I try to do is, rather than focus on the root causes of things which are likely to change every time there is an upset in the market, I will try to focus on some of the key business cycle drivers of that. Uh, so we're doing a lot of research on growth and inflation, which also have the added benefit of, I think, being the key driver of the stock bond correlation. So there's also a bit extra for everyone to be got in the game, not just the alpha, but also why uh, traditional asset allocation may suffer in years to come from this added volatility on the inflation front. Additional lines of research may include, you know, is valuation important, even for long short strategies on the cross asset risk premium side? And I know that that's a topic that's not very popular, and precisely because it's not popular, I would like to research it more. Yeah, if you think back to like, you know, 2008, 2009 period, you know, that if you just figured like, hey, money was me free for the next 14 years, you did great, right? And that regime was just so persistent, but the mindset then had that recency bias of like how difficult 2008 was. Or did you have something you wanted uh, to say? No, just on valuations, the fact that if you look at S&P performance over pretty much any year, 90% of that is driven by the changes in the multiple, which really have nothing to do with valuations and uh, nothing to do with earnings and everything to do with the market's perception of value, right? So behavioral aspects, psychological aspects, and then the macro factors are unfortunately dominating. Yeah. 